Acts chapter 1, we're going to read verses 1 to 11. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in in many ways that he was actually alive, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. So preparation and training are some are really great, of course, to get knowledge and skills and experience to do all kinds of different things. For example, way back when I was a youngster, when I was 23, I went to Olds College and took a course to be a farrier, to a horseshoer. And I found it pretty good training. It was uh, excellent preparation for skillfully doing that job. I was taught horse anatomy. I was taught theory to base my work on and then given the hands-on teaching and experience to gain the needed skills to actually help horses and not cripple them. I remember actually what we started with is we didn't start on live horses. We started on actually dead feet, believe it or not. And uh, you would hold them in your hold them between your knees and go at them. And my very first one, I hacked it so deep that I was so glad that it was just not a real horse because I would have crippled them. But we got over all that and got relatively good at what we did. And then I went on to work for a camp. That's a picture of me from way back yonder, even before Denise knew me. Uh, I took care of 50 to 60 horses and my training did help a lot to help keep the horses' feet in good shape so that they could pack kids around and hopefully give them a good experience. Now, for the followers of Jesus, especially the 12 apostles, if they were to tell people about Jesus and what he had done, which is what he had commanded them to do, they needed specific preparation to give them what they needed to do to do that job. Jesus had been preparing them for the last three years as he was living with them and ministering. And now in Acts 1, verses 1 to 11, he finishes preparing them. And from the way Jesus prepared his apostles, we as well as followers of Jesus can learn um, what we need to be prepared to live obediently to Jesus and be his witnesses to those around us. We're going to start the books of that book of Acts today, and we're going to be here for a while, of course, if we're going to go through the whole book. It's the history of the beginning of the church, going from a few timid and uncertain disciples to a movement that spread very quickly and has affected the whole world from then, even until now, 2,000 years later. As we go through the book, we need to remember that it's history. It's a historical book. It's not a teaching book, even though there's teaching in it. It it tells us what the people said. But it basically is there as history. It tells us what happened, who's involved, what they did, and yes, some of the things they said. The teaching letters of the New Testament give us the doctrine, the truths from God that that will help us understand a lot of what is going on. It works the same with the Gospels. They're historical. They tell you what happened. But if you want to know what Jesus' death meant, you also have to go to the teaching books too. And they will say more on it. Now through the books of Acts, we're going to learn a lot about what it means to be the church. How we relate to each other and how we relate to the rest of the world. So why was this book written? What was its main point? 
Well, to understand that, the beginning of this book is pretty critical. It's pretty crucial. And the author starts with the risen Christ, with the risen Christ Jesus. He starts his history during the time after Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead. This is a time period when Jesus was appearing to his disciples in his resurrected body and preparing them by giving them some final instructions. He did that for 40 days. In, in Acts 1.8, we get the theme literally for the whole book. Why it was written and the key things that we are told to learn from it. Jesus tell his followers, you will be my witnesses. And Acts shows how this new organism, the church, had its start and how, and how it grew until it fulfilled its mission of being witnesses, telling people about Jesus in Jerusalem and then in the rest of the country, including Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. Right to Rome itself. You will be my witnesses is the main reason for the existence of the church in this world. We live as forgiven sinners who, have now, who now have the presence of God in us through the Holy Spirit. And so now we have God's power to effectively tell others about Jesus and to live in obedience to him. We meet like this to glorify God in worship, Jesus in worship, and in praying together, and in learning God's word, and in loving each other, and then going out into our everyday lives, wherever our week holds for us, to model Jesus to others, living as he did, um, as he did tell, and telling others about him. If we want to know what it is to be the church and the follower of Jesus, we're going to learn a lot from this book. So, the introduction to the book of Acts is verse 1 and 2. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. Now, when we see that, we don't actually see an author's name. It doesn't say so-and-so to Theophilus. Uh, so we wonder, who wrote this book? Well, we do know who wrote it, a guy by the name of Luke. He was a medical doctor and a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. Paul calls Luke a doctor in Colossians 4.14 and talked a lot of traveling with him in uh, 2 Timothy 4.11 as well as Philemon verse 24. Now Luke talks in the first person about traveling with Paul in the book of Acts. Um, you watch for the pronouns to change from them to we and it comes in basically chapter 16 verse 11. Um, Luke was with Paul, wasn't with Paul all the time, but later he was. So as he said there, um, in my first book, I told you, so what's his first book? Well, his first book is the book of Luke. And who, is, and who is Theophilus is sort of the next question. Who is this guy? Well, Theophilus, would, is, uh, we don't know exactly who he is or where he lived. He likely a Roman official or another significant person. And we'll see why. He actually calls him most excellent, most honorable Theophilus, gives him that title. Um, so he's some kind of significant person. The, the name Theophilus is a Gentile name, a non-Jewish name. And thus, this also shows us that this book and the book of Luke were written to a Gentile, non-Jewish kind of audience for their understanding. We don't know where Luke wrote the Gospel of Acts, uh, but the time that for Luke would have been about the late 50s or early 60s um, AD, with Acts being written just a little bit later than that, probably around 63 AD. And when you think about that, that's only 30 years after Jesus' resurrection, after his life. And that's very important because those who were around at the time of Jesus, they could verify the things that Luke was saying, both in the book of Luke and in the book of Acts. If you think for yourself, there's only one of us here, unfortunately, that's not older than 40 years old. Um, but we won't pick on him as I normally do. But anyway, you can remember back 30 years. I can remember back to 1993, me and Denise actually went to Australia. And I could tell you some of the things that we did. You would remember back 30 years to when Jesus, um, with, if you were reading the book of Acts, and said, wait a minute, uh, Luke, this isn't right. But he had, but he had those things. Um, that's why it's so important it was written that closely to the time that it happened. Now, why was the book, book written? 
Just like Luke, it was written to help this guy by the name of Theophilus to know the truth about Jesus. And therefore, it serves the same purpose for us so that we can know the truth of who Jesus is. Let's actually look at the introduction to Luke. It's helpful for us. It says, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They used the eyewitness uh, reports circulating among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an accurate account, account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. So we know, of course, that the book of Acts is written by the same author of the book of Luke because of this introduction. And we know who wrote those books. Um, basically through history, the, the early disciples said it was, it was Luke. So the gospel of Luke, though, when we think about it, it's an eyewitness account. But it wasn't from Luke's own experience. But by his careful investigation of those who were eyewitnesses of the events that he wrote about. These were first-hand accounts of what had happened, which is extremely important so that we know what was written was accurate and didn't come hundreds of years later. Now, much of Acts is the same thing until we get to the point in, uh, in Acts where Luke brings himself into the story, which I said is about uh, Acts chapter 16, where he can, becomes a first-hand witness traveling with the Apostle Paul. Luke was a very great historian and researcher, and the details of, of the books, both of them, have been continuously verified through other ancient writings and archaeological evidences. Um, arche archaeologists love his writings because they can look at it and go to the place and find what he said, find the places that he mentioned. So Luke start, starts Acts, his second book, with, with a one-sentence summary of his gospel, the book of Luke. Let's go back to that. Verses 1 and 2 of Acts 1. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. So the Gospel of Luke was about, of course, Jesus. Who he is, what he did, what he taught, and, of course, his death and resurrection. And now in Acts, he starts out at the time of Jesus' resurrection when he was still giving the apostles instructions. Jesus is preparing his apostles to be witnesses with proof that he was actually alive. Verse 3, during the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked with, to them about the kingdom of God. So 40 days of proof of the resurrection, he was with the disciples. Now, why would that be needed? Well, put yourself in their shoes. They saw him die and get buried. They were pretty distraught, as you, when you read in the Gospels of everything. And 40 days of him physically appearing to them, talking to them, walking with them, even eating with them. With Jesus was very tangible proof, obviously, that Jesus was literally, physically alive. The bodily resurrection of Jesus is a historical fact of which they are eyewitnesses. So they become our eyewitnesses of this. And the fast fact of the resurrection establishes who Jesus was, is. He is the perfect, innocent Son of God. The resurrection establishes what Jesus did. By he, that he died paying the penalty that all humans deserve for their sin, but being raised in victory over death so that Jesus becomes the source of eternal life for anyone who will turn from their sin and put their trust in Jesus and give them their lives to follow him. When the apostles told others about what they had seen and experienced with Jesus, many people believed them. We're going to see that in the book of Acts here. And they became followers of Jesus as well. But we're also going to see that a lot of people rejected their message and made life very difficult for the apostles, even killing them. And they eventually all were, were killed for their faith, except for Apostle John. So they needed to know. They needed to know without any doubt that Jesus was alive. And, they, and what they were going to do in order to advance the kingdom of God, as they told others about Jesus, they needed to know that Jesus was alive. So he appeared to them, as it says there, over a period of 40 days. 
The next thing they needed to know in preparation was they had to wait for the promised gift. Verses 4 and 5. Once, once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. A gift, the Holy Spirit. Now who or what is the Holy Spirit and why is he a gift? And yes, I said he. He is the third person of the Trinity. The Trinity simply is that we believe there is one God, but that God is three divine, co-equal, co-eternal persons. That isn't contradictory, but it's not three gods. It's one God, three divine, co-equal, co-eternal persons. God the Father, God the Son, and yes, God the Holy Spirit. He is not just a force. He is not just the power of God. He is a person, a he, not an it. And Jesus promised to send them earlier um, when he's talking to the disciples. John 14 is one place that he said that. John 14, 16. Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who, who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him, notice the hymns, because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. That's important wording there. We'll get to that. So we've learned what Jesus says there, that the Holy Spirit is going to be an advocate, which means somebody who defends or helps someone else. And he spiritually helps God's people. He leads into all truth. That's another thing he does, helping God's people, us understand God's word. And here, before Jesus' death and resurrection, he promises that the Holy Spirit would live in God's people. Not with, but literally in, personally indwelling each believer. And so, in Acts 1-5 there, he, Jesus reminds them of this, of this promise, and what would happen within just a few more days for them. In Acts 1-8, he says also that the Holy Spirit will give power to be witnesses um, in what they as believers say and how they live. Now Jesus likened there um, to receiving the Holy Spirit to being baptized. He says in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Just like John baptized with water, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now when people were baptized by John the Baptist, they were immersed in water, dunked in water, immersed in water as a public declaration of their repentance. That was the point that he was doing that they were turning from sin so that they were ready for the Messiah. That's what John's baptism was all about. Now what Jesus is talking about is will not be an immersion of water, but being immersed in the Holy Spirit. One of the Greek uses for the word baptizo, which is brought directly into English, so makes us, gives us the word baptism, was actually a recipe for pickles, believe it or not. The cucumber is baptized, dunked, immersed in the brine. And so it's in the brine, and the brine is in it. And that's kind of the picture that we get there um, of, what baptism, of what this is. It's a good description of what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in us, um, basically is the idea. And these guys had to wait a few days to receive this promise. But for us, this is something we receive the moment we put our trust in Jesus, the moment we become a follower of Jesus. Right then, the Holy Spirit makes us spiritually alive. We call that regeneration, that we belong to God. The Holy Spirit lives in us to help us, lead us, and strengthens us to obediently obey God. And that's huge, because no one of us, none of us can live the way God wants us to live without the power of the Holy Spirit. No one of us can be witnesses for Jesus either without the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's getting to that pretty quickly here. But for the moment, after telling him to wait, Jesus prepares his disciples to not be distracted. Verses 6 and 7. So when the apostles were with Jesus, he kept, they kept asking him, Lord, has a time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. 
From the beginning of Jesus' ministry, his disciples and everyone in Israel knew from prophecy that the Messiah, the rescuer who was sent from God, was supposed to be a king over Israel and rescue Israel from all its enemies and bring the nation into great prosperity. And that's what they were looking for. But the scripture also prophesied of a suffering servant, of the Messiah who would suffer for the sins of the people, rescuing them from the penalty of their sin. And that is what Jesus came for. By this time, the disciples fully understand this. But they're also still wondering if Jesus will now be that triumphant king. Now that he's died on the cross, risen from the dead, are you going to be that triumphant king? Are you going to restore Israel's greatness? But this is still not Jesus' purpose. Jesus will fulfill those prophecies in, in the Father's time, but not right now. He doesn't want them distracted from their real job of telling everybody about Jesus. Jesus is giving the apostles instructions for the rest of their earthly lives, basically. Rather than worrying about what God is in charge of and they aren't, and what he will do in their time, Jesus wants all of his followers now to be my witnesses. He goes on to verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The primary thing that the apostles must wait for, what they must wait for before being witnesses for Jesus, is the power they will receive when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. God was going to do something new. In the past, when you read the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come on people for special things. Uh, that God gave them to do, such as being a king, King David. The Holy the Spirit came upon him and empowered him to do what he was doing. Or a prophet like Elijah. Or even just like the apostles, Jesus gave them the power to heal when they were with Jesus. But now the Holy Spirit is going to come upon and live in every believer to give them power to be witnesses for Jesus. And this is coming in the second chapter, of course, of Acts here. And the apostles need to stay in Jerusalem until that point. Then when the Holy Spirit comes on all followers of Jesus, they will be his witnesses, starting with where they were right at that moment in Jerusalem. Because in God's perfect timing, um, when the Holy Spirit comes was a time of a major festival when the Jews had gathered from all over the world and the church is born. And that basically covers Acts chapter 1 through to 7, the part where they are in Jerusalem. Then they do get out from Jerusalem and get around to the rest of the land of Israel, including Samaria. And that takes us into Acts 8, chapters 8 to chapters 11. And then the rest of the book, the rest of the book of Acts, takes the gospel, shows how the gospel goes to the rest of the nations, including all the way to Rome. So this verse is really the theme of the whole book. It's describing what's going to happen throughout the whole book. It's the great commission from Jesus to tell everybody in the world the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection for them. Now this stands for us even now. Even now as we are not done telling everybody about Jesus. We aren't done that great commission. This command of Jesus is foundational for who every follower of Jesus is and what the church exists for. And the method is still the same. We can only do it in the Holy Spirit's power. The difference between us and the apostles at the time of this account that we're reading is that the coming of the Holy Spirit has happened and we have no need to wait. Every follower of Jesus has the Holy Spirit, which means that God has given us his people everything we need to live in obedient lives to him and to be his witnesses to the people around us and even to the whole world. Now with all this preparation and instruction to the apostles done, it's now time for Jesus to leave, ending his personal appearances to the apostles. We see the ascension of Jesus to heaven. Verse 9. After saying this, after saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. Now, if you think back in the Old Testament, a cloud is very often a symbol of God's presence, of his glory. 
If we think of the of Mount Sinai, when Jesus, well, Jesus, sorry, when God came down on Mount Sinai, it was this massive cloud hiding God's presence and following along in the tabernacle. There was a cloud above it and things like that. Even in the transfiguration of Jesus, when he was changed and the disciples could see his glory on a mountain somewhere, God's presence, the cloud came by and hid Jesus and God said, this is my son with whom I'm pleased, listen to him. And then the cloud went away. So Jesus was going up into a, and, and went into a cloud, which we can think of as God's presence, God's glory. He physically left the earth and took his proper place in heaven. Ephesians 1, 2 and 8 tells us about this. It says, this is the mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him at their place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else. Not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. So Jesus is the head of, this, of his church, which means he's the head of every one of us, of his believers, his followers. As well as, of course, all believers everywhere, all his followers together. We as his followers are to live in obedience to our king, the Lord Jesus. And we are to be, as he said, his witnesses. We are to be his witnesses in every area of our life and to keep going until Jesus comes back. Because we next see the promise of the return of Jesus in verses 10 and 11. As they strained to see him rising into heaven... Two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Now the book started with Jesus appearing to his disciples to prove that he was alive. One of the reasons he did that was because he was going to be leaving them, and it's vital they knew he was alive. Because he is still the Lord, the king, the head of the church. And he also promises to return. Jesus prepared his apostles for the time that he would leave. They were simply to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then things would start to happen as they became his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Even now, the gospel has come to here, Golden Prairie, Saskatchewan, as well as many other places in the earth. Jesus is our risen and living king. He's our Lord. He's the head of the church. And he is that because he is still alive. And he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, the Father. And he will continue to be there until he returns in the same way we saw him go. Sorry, they saw him go. You will be my witnesses is still the main reason for the church existing. Because the people back then and now really are not any different. We learn this as we read through Acts. We have the same temptations, the same failures, the same successes and joys as the people back then and the t- that time. We need the same kind of preparation the apostles received from Jesus to equip us and strengthen us to live obedient lives to Jesus and to be his witnesses we learn from the first 11 verses in acts that we can really believe that jesus rose from the dead that he proved that he was god in the flesh they had jesus those people had jesus right in front of them as evidence and we have them as our eyewitnesses very trustworthy eyewitnesses as well as lots of other historical evidences and if you want to learn more about that ask me i got lots of information on that type of thing We found out as well that when we choose to follow Jesus, we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we are immersed in him and he will live in us. It's a mystery we don't really understand, but we do know that that we will never be without God in our lives, without his power living in us. He is in us. We also saw that just like the disciples, we can get distracted from what's most important pretty easily. They were distracted by, well, are you going to be king? Well, we can be distracted by good things in life, by just being busy with life, with work, with raising a family. 
doing charity work or even work in the church they can distract us from doing the most important things which is spending time with Jesus following him and doing things like telling others about him because the main point our first priority is to be witnesses as he said for Jesus in our lives through the Holy Spirit we strive to be like Jesus so that people will see him through us he'll see him they will see us be changed by Jesus so that we will look like Jesus himself with the fruit of the Spirit love joy peace patience kindness goodness uh, faithfulness gentleness self-control the things the Holy Spirit brings in believers lives as we relate to those around us we have the chance to tell others that Jesus Jesus made us this way he is the one who saved us and he helps us every day we're often hesitant we're often hesitant to talk to others about Jesus not knowing what to say I don't know what to say what kind of words do I use in the new year we're planning to have training on how to share your faith naturally and well something please keep in mind and look forward to but right now pray for opportunities keep your eyes open to what God brings you to say when he brings you to say something about Jesus to the people around you if you want to know more about how to share your faith effectively even now we have lots of helps available for that too finally we learned that Jesus promised to come back it's been a long time since he went up to heaven and millions will now be in heaven for eternity because they had the time and they had the opportunity to hear of Jesus and choose to follow him and that's why he hasn't come back yet he's giving people time he's letting people giving opportunity to come to know who he is but he is coming back he said he would and it and he doesn't break his promises he told us to expect him anytime and the way the world looks it could be anytime very soon he is coming and people must know about Jesus and let's share our good news with them and be his witnesses let's pray together father thank you for this beginning to the book of Acts and uh, just that key thing there that we are to be your witnesses throughout this whole world we are not in Jerusalem we are not in Judea Samaria we are in the rest of the world and we thank you father that you have reached out to us help us father to be obedient in whatever way you are you have been speaking to us about help us to not be uh, afraid give us courage to live our faith and to speak our faith to those people around us so just help us in whatever way that you want um, uh, wanted us to respond to your word and be obedient to it and we give you the thanks and the honor and the glory in Jesus name Amen